Well, it's going to talk to us today about climate informatics and machine learning for the study of climate change. Claire is an associate professor of computer science at the University of Colorado Boulder, which she joined in 2018 following positions in Paris Saclay and um, George Washington University and Columbia University. She, she completed and she holds a bachelor's of earth and planetary science from Harvard. Her research is on machine learning for climate change. And um, one of the great initiatives Claire, Claire Monteleone started in 2011 was she co-founded the International Workshop on Climate Informatics. And it's going to be 10 years this year. Um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Claire, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thanks so much for the kind introduction and thanks for inviting me. Um, I hope to someday visit Manchester. Um, so we study climate informatics due to um, the threat of climate change and the extreme events we've been witnessing such as extreme storms, uh, heat waves causing wildfire um, and drought and their effects on communities and ecosystems. And climate informatics is based on the vision that machine learning can shed light on climate change. So we have critical mass. Um, so this sort of joint field bringing together data science, AI machine learning with climate science and the study of climate change we call climate informatics. And as Danielle mentioned, um, we've um, been running uh, first a workshop and now it'll be a conference um, for 10 years now. And we were supposed to be in Oxford. Uh, we will be virtual. Um, if there are um, students or folks that um, <laughs> have time in the next few days, we do have an abstract submission and a paper submission deadline coming up um, to present at Climate Informatics. Otherwise, you're welcome to just attend online. And we also have a hackathon, which I think in light of this data science workshop, when you think about applying machine learning to any domain, hackathons are a great way to start the collaborations because you get people from different domain backgrounds, some with um, machine learning experience, um, some with domain experience to collaborate on addressing some um, you know, we've done things like prediction tasks, storm intensity prediction, El Nino Southern Oscillation prediction, but you could do the same thing for your domain. Um, so uh, five or six years ago, we were talking to NeurIPS, you know, a, a top machine learning meeting, trying to um, get more people to work on climate change. And similar to bioinformatics, um, you can imagine sort of the early days of bioinformatics where you're just sort of imagining where machine learning might have an impact. We, we broke the world down into these various problem areas, but I want to emphasize um, while there's been some work in each of these areas and a lot of interesting open problems in each of these areas, we may just be scratching the surface. Of course, machine learning could have a lot more impact. Um, so there's issues of if you just have data from ice cores or tree rings, and other sort of um, proxies of what temperature was in the distant past. You know, how can we reconstruct past climates, which is very important to put the current climate in context. Um, in green are areas that my group has worked on. And of course, in 20 minutes, I'm only gonna do one, which is climate downscaling. Um, so I'll get to that shortly, but we've also done work on, you know, if you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there's you know, 35 models from all different teams and labs throughout the world that inform it. And if you look at future predictions, there's a lot of disagreement and variance across those, um, those mathematical models, those uh, physics-driven climate simulations. And so we've done work showing that you can use AI to sort of uh, reduce uncertainty on those ensemble predictions. Um, all of the problems involve spatiotemporal data with you know, interesting dependencies. Um, so if that's you know, your area of expertise, that might be um, a way that you could collaborate with someone in climate because there's very interesting spatiotemporal data problems. And we just um, showed those pictures of the megastorms and the extremes. Well, it turns out there's a lot of uncertainty around extremes and how they may change with climate change. And we've worked some there. I mentioned briefly um, 
well, we did a hurricane intensity prediction hackathon and we did a hurricane track prediction um, paper recently. Um, but we don't have too much time and I'm not gonna do all three of these. I just wanted to mention for those that are particularly interested in deep learning, um, we've recently done some unsupervised and semi-supervised deep learning in an avalanche detection task. This was with Meteo France, um, which is you know the French meteorological division of the government um, to detect avalanches in the Alps. I'm gonna talk specifically today just about the middle topic, unsupervised deep learning for downscaling. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we did um, hurricane track forecasting. That was a completely supervised setting, but there were some interesting data fusion issues that we had to um, address with our deep learning architecture. So for those that wanna keep in touch when we can you know, email afterward or meet in person, these are some of the other deep learning areas we've done. And then we've also done um, stuff using online learning and a variety of other techniques. Um, so given that I probably only have time for one vignette, I decided, so my group these days is really excited about unsupervised deep learning techniques. And so I'm going to motivate this in a case study on downscaling of temperature and precipitation. So um, this is just a quick pointer um, for those that are familiar with, with deep learning um, of of just the simple way that unsupervised deep learning as a problem framework differs from the problem framework of supervised deep learning. So, um, you know, at a very high level, we're gonna be learning in the supervised case, a network parameterized by these weights W that given some input, some feature vector will, predict, will produce some output, right? This could be, um, a vector, a scalar, you know, a class label, depending on the task. And just in a nutshell, if we really want to boil down and simplify all of deep learning, right, we write down some loss function, which is how we penalize the prediction y hat of the network compared to the true label. And so this is for supervised deep learning. So once we've written down the loss function, then essentially we're doing gradient descent on it, taking little uh, gradient steps that are propagated through to update our weights W, essentially using the chain rule. So this slide um, is intended to make it very simple and straightforward what unsupervised deep learning means, which is really we have almost the same setup, right? We're gonna learn some weights W. Um, the only difference is that when we define our loss function, of course, it's going to penalize, it's going to be looking at the output of the network here, we're calling that x hat, but it can't take into account some other label y. The only other thing it can take other than the output to the network is the input to the network. But that's the only distinction. We can write down a loss function and then we optimize it using gradient descent to updates our, our weights w. So, um, if this speaks to you because you understand the general optimization setting in, in supervised deep learning, um, great. If, if not, we'll get into more details. And actually the unsupervised method we're gonna show is maybe more complicated by, than this, but at a high level, you know, if you don't have a label, you can still write down some objective function uh, between the network output and the network input. And then there's a lot of things you can do with unsupervised deep learning. So that's what my group is really excited about these days. Um, so in this one uh, vignette for the workshop, I wanted to talk about the work of Brian Gronke. Um, he just finished up his master's um, in my group in computer science, and then he's joining a climate science group um, in Potsdam, Germany for his PhD, assuming we can figure out the logistics of him traveling there and being admitted. Um, there's issues, of course, with COVID, but um, so he wanted to take this very classic problem in climate and me meteorology called downscaling um, and address it using um, generative unsupervised deep learning. So there's a bit of a mismatch, like in machine learning, we might call this like upscaling or upsampling, but here, what we mean by downscaling as defined in the climate meteorolo meteorology, uh, meteorology literature is that you have um, some spatial fields, some spatiotemporal fields, 
but it's at a coarse scale and you would like to infer the values at a finer scale. In computer vision, we would maybe think of this as super resolution, but um, in our case, since, um, since it's a physical process and there's a lot of small subscale structure, um, we wanna use something um, that retains more information about what's happening at finer scales than just sort of super resolving. So there's a field called statistical downscaling and um, in our understanding of the existing work there, the techniques that are using learning are using supervised learning and they're providing point predictions. And so what we mean by that is if I have a map over Europe, say of temperature at a very coarse grid scale, these methods would allow, um, taking that as input would allow you to output um, a one map at a finer grid scale. But we'd like something generative. We'd actually like uh, to be able to query a whole distribution over such maps at the finer scale. Um, so he um, focused on domain alignment for which there've been some recent um, interesting methods um, in the deep unsupervised learning space in machine learning. Um, and in particular, he made an extension of the recent align flow algorithm that came out at this AAAI um, and, and customized it a little bit by using a glow normalizing flow um, and it worked. And so my interpretation of why it works is that we can actually view that there is some self supervisory signal. So while it's unsupervised in that we don't need paired maps at the two different resolutions, we don't ever need to train with any paired imagery. Um, just by virtue of the fact that the imagery at the two different resolutions is um, is oriented in the same geographical alignment. So in our case, we did continental US, um, gives us some sort of geographical self-supervisory signal that um, the method is most likely exploiting such that when you learn a shared latent space, you can get um, informative distributions. Okay. Um, so, you know, for the purpose of the AI, we don't really care what where the data comes from. For the purpose of the application, what's kind of interesting is not only, so we'll have ERA, which is at our coarse scale resolution, one degree latitude by one degree longitude, um, is a reanalysis prod product, which means the data basically comes from observations and then it's um, sort of smoothed um, through some existing mathematical models. And then we have WARF, which is a numerical weather prediction model. So that's simulated data at high resolution. So this is at one eighth degree resolution in latitude and longitude. That's our, our finer scale. So what's interesting um, from the sort of weather perspective, maybe not from an L ML perspective, is that these are actually, not only are they at different resolutions, these um, are generated from different processes. We have observations and we have, um, simulations. And so we had, um, we did a temperature task. That's um, some of the data examples are visualized on the top. And we also did a precipitation task. And we can compare what the coarse and fine grained um, precipitation maps um, looked like on the bottom. Um, so domain alignment um, is a task being studied in machine learning where we have two different random variables. And essentially we wanna learn an invertible mapping F as follows. So if we sample from the marginal of X, um, we, by then applying F to those samples will approximate the marginal of Y. Similarly, if we sample from the marginal of Y, um, applying F inverse to those samples, Y I will approximate the marginal of X. Okay, um, so you know if we can do that, then we'll easily be able to downscale or even upscale, just uh, go back and forth in a probabilistic way between the in our setting the coarse grained data we'll call that um, say x and the fine grained data y. Okay, um, so um, we're we're saying um, to view this as um, 
an approach to downscaling, let one domain be the coarse grain data. It really doesn't matter. This is all symmetric, but we'll call it X for how I've drawn the figure. Um, and we'll have uh, the other domain, uh, the fine grained be Y. Um, and so ideally we, what we want to learn is a, a shared latent space. So a joint distribution over X and Y. Um, and we are going to do this via a, a shared, a, a distribution of a shared latent space Z. Um, and this this will be um, aided by making a, a conditional independence assumption. So we'll assume that um, conditioned on your latent variable um, Z, X and Y are conditionally independent. So we all we need to know is that we're going to have IID samples from X, from the marginal of X, and IID samples from the marginal of Y. We will never need any paired maps, uh, X, Y pairs. That's why it's unsupervised. Um, and so you'll see that to get a meaningful joint over X and Y, it'll just remain to compute the conditional distributions of, um, of each domain given the, the shared latent space Z. And so we're using a technique called a line flow to do that, um, which uh, sort of connects the two different domains to a shared latent space by learning two normalizing flows. So normalizing flows start with a very simple prior distribution on your latent space Z, and then learn a series of invertible transforms so you can get a much more um, informative latent distribution. So if you started with an isotropic Gaussian, you can get um, much more informative um, distributions. So again, I'll repeat, this is unsupervised because training does not result, uh, not involve any paired X and Y examples. We just need samples from both of the two marginals. Um, so this is the architecture. Um, this is a figure made by the student Brian, but I mean, the architecture follows a line flow. He made the change of using no, uh, glow as his normalizing flow because it yielded very realistic images on some you know face task that these these guys had published on we want, we thought it would be helpful in climate as well this looks quite complicated i guess the only things i want to emphasize are we're not going to change dimension when we go to the latent space and so we'll stick with the number of points so the size of the field as in the high resolution space and so what we do at the low resolution space is simply upsample in the way that makes the least additional um, assumptions about information. So we'll just sort of look at what neighboring grid boxes have um, to compute um, an upsampling. In terms of training the neural network, uh, actually the only parameters here are that the glows, so the normalizing flow parameters. So we're we're learning this mapping from our, um, our very simple prior um, to now parameterize a bijection between um, our X inputs and our latent space Z. And then a separate one is learned for our Y inputs and our latent space Z. Um, and we can compare with the machine learning benchmarks for um, for the task. And we actually don't know of any other um, techniques that are unsupervised, let alone provide um, a generative model. So we had to compare only to supervised methods. And for the evaluation, we just evaluated on point predictions, meaning that we weren't, we couldn't do an apples to apples comparison of our generative capabilities because these other two techniques were um, just using point, we're just producing point predictions. So BCSD is sort of the um, standard um, downscaling approach in the literature. And then this Banyo Medina paper came out in Climate Informatics 2019. It's a supervised CNN approach. And what you want to see is that our method, the unsupervised method, is doing not much worse than any of the supervised methods. Um, and it tends to check out. In fact, it usually outperforms BCSD, which is the standard method and does a bit worse than the CNN supervised method. 
But again, the CNN supervised method requires this sort of ground truth knowledge of the pairing between each image, um, between each pair of images at the different um, resolutions and is not generative. Um, okay, I'm coming up on time. <laughs> let, me, let me just quickly run through some results. So um, if we take as input this low resolution um, precipitation image, the coarse grain resolution ERA at the rightmost top figure. Um, on, a, on an example where we do have a paired image to evaluate against, the middle top image is, is, the, is the paired image at the higher resolution. The model prediction is in the gray box. And then also to sort of show that we can sample, we can take these um, conditional samples conditioned on this input of the ERA, um, fine uh, coarse grained map and get all these fine grained realizations. Um, and this is helpful, I think, for domain experts to see um, different variations that you can get by sampling. Um, also following the idea that you'll see in some of these align flow and other domain alignment papers, we can do a latent space interpolation. So if we take real data points on the two extremes of the top row, those are real um, precipitation maps in our data set. I mean, real as in their output by our, um, our numerical weather predictor, oops. Um, and then we can walk through the latent space and then use those discretized uh, latent states to then generate both at the high resolution and at the low resolution and then you know show this to to climate science or to you know meteorologists and they think that it's like a physically plausible temporal interpolation at both the high and low resolution scales um so wrapping up um you know i love that this is an interdisciplinary workshop so i want to plug um for folks um there's a lot of great climate scientists and meteorologists in the UK. Um, this is a great area. The data sets are public um, and there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Um, and there's also some predictability that you get from physics. So yeah, join us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Claire, for that great talk. Um, if people have questions, they could put it in the in the Google Doc. But we do have a question here. So someone asks, although the two sets of imagery do not have to be paired, how loose are the constraints on how well aligned they are? For example, um, the same coordinate reference system, consistent misalignment of latitude or longitude. Oh, that's a great question. So the, the only version that we tried was a temporal misalignment because that's very interesting in terms of climate change. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we stuck with the spatial alignment, um, but not only were the two domains generated by different processes, but they were um, generated um, at different um, to model different time periods of, um, of, of observations or simulations in that region. Um, and it actually performed pretty well because um, that'll basically just get, um, that'll, that'll basically just affect the um, latent space distribution. And so you won't really um, see it in the predictions. Um, in terms, so I, I, I think the more interesting question is the one that you raised, which is um, around the spatial alignment. And so there's nothing in the, um, in sort of the setup of the algorithm. And certainly as with most cutting edge deep learning papers, there's not much theory <laughs> um, that has been proven yet about these algorithms um, that'll specify any um, alignment. But my understanding my interpretation of why we got nice results in this completely unsupervised training is that ultimately you can view the fact that we were looking at the continental U US in both settings, right, as a form of self-supervision. So I think this is more of my interpretation and it's sort of wide open in terms of theory. So I could imagine, 
I mean, this is actually a great scope for future work is um, to say for such a technique, um, can I quantify like my degree of accuracy in the self-supervisory aspect? So how well they're aligned to say, um, you know, some performance measure. So that's a very interesting thought. Um, but yeah, I don't have much more to say on that. Okay, 